Hear now the word of the Lord from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 20 through 25. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters and he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. This is the word of the Lord which is given to us this morning in love. Uh, This morning, I I want to open our study of this passage uh, with a a fairly simple question. Uh, How should we pursue evangelism as a church? So evangelism uh, just means the the process of sharing the good news about Jesus with other people in hopes that they'll come to faith. And so what should we do as a church to do that, to, to share the good news of Jesus with other people? Now, whenever I ask a question like that, I'm, I'm aware that it's a fairly loaded question. Probably you have lots of ideas on exactly what we should do. Uh, maybe you've uh, participated in some intensive evangelism exercises, gone door to door or, or talked to people in public uh, uh, just at random. Uh, or maybe you've uh, gone to seminars or maybe you've uh, taken classes or maybe you've uh, read books or, or articles or, or listened to podcast episodes about how to do evangelism. And you might have uh, an abundance of ideas about what we should be doing as a church to pursue evangelism. But I also know that it's not only ideas that you might have. I also know whenever you ask a question about evangelism, there's probably also an emotional reaction. Uh, You may be feeling fear. You're not going to ask me to do something where I might say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time and mess all of this up, are you? Or maybe guilt. Oh, gosh, I, I know I'm supposed to be doing more evangelism, but I just never seem to get around to it. And these reactions then, of course, only further cloud the issue of what we should be doing to pursue evangelism as a church. Well, surprisingly, as we come to the fourth paragraph where we're dealing with this old ancient question, should the church at Corinth allow people to, in worship, use untranslated languages in their worship services? It seems like such an old question, such an ancient question, such a question that seems like has nothing to do with us. And yet, as we have seen, each time Paul answers this question, he doesn't just say the same thing in a different way. He's giving us new principles, timeless principles about what our worship should be that he's appealing to. And this morning, Paul is appealing to the way in which our worship should play an integral role in what we are doing as a church for the sake of evangelism, reaching other people with the good news of Christ. So we're going to see that as we go. Uh, Let's start then with a simple principle that will get us into this passage. Our big idea today is that God converts unbelievers by His Word. God converts unbelievers by His Word. So, three parts to this passage that we're looking at. The first has to do with a contrast that Paul is going to give us. The contrast between tongues, or foreign languages, and prophecy. Then second, we're going to see the confirmation. uh, The confirmation specifically of unbelief. And then third, uh, Paul is going to talk about the conversion of unbelievers, the conversion of unbelievers. So let's start in that first section in verses 20 through 22, uh, this contrast that Paul is giving us between tongues or languages and prophecy. So let's, uh, in verse 20, uh, Paul is urging us to be mature in our thinking. Let's look at what he says again. He says, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Uh, Stop there for a moment. Children have this wonderful way of being extraordinarily over-the-top excited about things that uh, really are are shiny or exciting or weird uh, sometimes, uh, but not necessarily excitement because of anything that's substantive. I came home um, uh, this week, 
uh, from, from work, and, and my children just had to get my attention, had to talk with me, had to show me. I've, I've rarely seen them so excited about something. I'm thinking, are they, have they cured cancer? What's happening? No, they were catching crickets and putting them in a pot for no real reason just to do it. Now, that's a wonderful thing. Children should catch crickets, right? That's a part of growing up. Children think this way. Children do these kinds of things. That's excellent. It's wonderful. But Paul says, when we're talking about serious things, we can't think like children. We can't gravitate towards what's exciting or shiny or sparkly or gross in some cases if you're dealing with crickets. We have to think with maturity. Now, Paul says, certainly there is a sense in which you should be like children. He says, be infants in evil, absolutely naive about the wicked ways of the world. But he says, in your thinking, be mature. Now, Paul has a reason for saying this. It's, it's a general principle that's good, but he has a specific application for it. And toward this end, to make their thinking more mature, specifically in this question of what should they be doing in public worship, Paul then in verse 21 appeals to, cites, uh, quotes a passage from the Old Testament. He says, uh, says that this comes from the law, in the law it is written, um, and sometimes the law refers to the first five books of the Bible, the law of Moses, uh, but here it's just a, a general term to refer to the Old Testament as a whole. And so Paul refers back to the, the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, and he's citing verses 11 and 12. He says, he, he says in the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So Paul is saying this is how we're going to mature your thinking, or what's happening here. Paul wants us to pay special attention to that passage, to think about what's going on and recognize what's happening there. It's a fascinating passage because in Isaiah chapter 28, God is rebuking his people his hard-hearted, unbelieving people for the fact that God has spoken to them again and again and again by prophets. He sent to them prophets to go to them repeatedly. And God said, I've spoken to you clearly by prophets. I've spoken to you repeatedly by prophets. In fact, I have spoken to you redundantly, repeating myself over and over to repeat myself over and over to repeat myself. If you look at the passage in Isaiah chapter 28... Right before this, the verse before this, God illustrates his redundancy. He says, for it is precept upon precept. And then he says it again, precept upon precept. Line upon line, and he says it again, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. There's a redundancy. I've said this so often. And you haven't listened to these prophets who've spoken to you the word of the Lord with absolute clarity. Well, God says, I'm not done talking to you. I'm going to keep doing this, but this time the people I send to you will not speak your language. You are going to hear foreign languages in your midst. It's going to be rough. It's going to be strange. It's going to be barbarous to your ears. And when you hear the language of the Assyrians speaking in your midst, you will know that that is a sign that I am about to carry you off because of your sin into exile and captivity. And when that happens, I'm going to remove you from your land where you're surrounded by other people who speak your language and relocate you and scatter you into all kinds of foreign lands where you will be surrounded by other people who will speak other foreign languages and you will still not be able to hear them, to understand them. These foreign languages were going to be the signal, the sign that the judgment of exile was coming. But sadly, even then they will not listen to me. And so, right after that, once again, God talks about the redundancy and the repetitiveness. He's going to speak to them, although this time not with clarity. In verse 13 of Isaiah chapter 28, right after the passage that Paul is quoting, he says, and the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. What Isaiah was saying is that when you hear this word, it will not convert you. It will not change your mind. It will not change your heart. You're already too far gone. All these times I've been speaking to you clearly by the prophets, and I might as well have been speaking to you in Akkadian, the language of the Assyrians. Well, if you're not going to listen, 
If you're going to be hard-hearted in your unbelief, then I'll give you exactly what you have wanted. I will give you people who will speak to you in these foreign languages. And you will not be able to understand, but even then you will not believe. You will not be converted from unbelief. You will only be confirmed in the hard-heartedness of your unbelief. Now that passage and what is happening in Isaiah is really important in verse 21 of our passage in 1 Corinthians 14 to understand exactly what Paul means in verse 22. Because if you look at your Bibles, in verse 22, Paul starts with, I don't know what your translation has, mine has thus. Paul is saying, you know what I just said, think about that because that will help you to understand what I'm about to say in verse 22. And verse 22 is a notoriously difficult verse to understand because it sounds like Paul says one thing and then immediately contradicts himself in verses 23 through 25. It sounds like he's saying that tongues will be a sign that will convert unbelievers. But then in 23, Paul says that, no, if you're speaking in tongues in your, foreign, or in, your, in your worship services, the unbelievers will be driven away thinking that you're out of your mind. And then it says he sounds like prophecy in verse 22 is a sign, not for unbelievers, but for believers. I guess that means we reserve prophecy only for believers. Well, no, Paul says that prophecy is the thing that converts unbelievers. But in verse 22, if we understand what was happening in the book of Isaiah, what Paul is quoting, the reason Paul is quoting Isaiah 28 verses 11 through 12, then verse 22 makes a lot of sense. Paul is saying, thus tongues are a sign, not for the conversion of unbelievers, but tongues are a sign that's fitting for unbelief. You haven't listened to the clear prophets I've sent speaking your language in your midst. Let me give you exactly what you want. People who won't even speak your language so that you won't even be stressed by understanding the words that they are saying. If you're going to pay me that little attention, I am going to give you your heart's desire by giving you these tongues so that the language will go right over your heads. You will believe whether it's a foreign language or the same language, all the same, which is to say you won't believe it at all. And the reason that Paul, one of the, part of the reason we know this is what Paul is saying is notice that Paul says tongues. He says, thus, tongues are a sign not for believers. This word for tongues, or sometimes it's just single tongue, it shows up 15 times in this chapter. In every other time, there is an explicit word that tells you that this is about speaking. Uh, It's talking about the one who is speaking in a tongue or praying in a tongue or has a, a tongue to bring to the worship service to offer in the worship service. But here, Paul is talking not about speaking in tongues, about hearing in tongues. When you hear this language, it is a sign not of blessing, but of your doom and judgment where you will be carried off into exile because you have not believed my prophetic word. This is why Paul is so serious about this. This is why Paul wants the Corinthians to understand with mature thinking. This isn't a game for children. The environment you are creating in your worship service is not a representation of the gospel, of the blessing of God to sinners who who can come to faith in Jesus Christ and find forgiveness. This is a symbol of God's judgment, and you're playing with this like it's a toy for children. And in doing so, as the worshipers hear these foreign languages, it's as though they are in exile in a foreign land surrounded by foreign, strange speech. Well, when we understand this is what Paul means in verse 22, not a sign that tongues are not a sign to convert unbelievers, but tongues are a sign that are fitting for unbelief, that's matched to unbelief, entirely unintelligible as a sign of the judgment that's coming. Well, then we understand what Paul means in verse 23 when he tells us about the confirmation of unbelief. So now we're in our second section, verse 23, the confirmation of unbelief. Paul writes, If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your mind? So in Isaiah's day, the the unbelievers who heard strange tongues were the hard-hearted, unbelieving Israelites, God's people, and they're not believing the word of the Lord that had come to them through prophets. But now Paul is thinking about the, the worship service in Corinth. Not ancient Israel, but a worship service in Corinth. Um, And now he's saying, think not about the the hard-hearted Israelites. Think about the the pagan, unbelieving Gentiles who come off the street and wander into the worship service to hear the word of the Lord. And when they get there, they don't hear God's word. They hear you all speaking as though you're out of your minds. 
Far from changing their heart and their minds, what you are doing will confirm and strengthen their unbelief so that they can feel good about rejecting Jesus Christ and washing their hands of Him. That's the problem. These tongues are a sign not to convert unbelievers. They are a sign of judgment. And just like Isaiah's prophecy and the strange speech of the Assyrians confirmed the hard-hearted unbelief of Israel all the way, including when they were taken off into exile, so also it will have the same effect on these unbelievers in your worship services. Remember, Paul wants us to think with maturity to get past our childish fascination for the impressiveness of these tongues in worship, to see the real damage that is being done when people can't understand what is being spoken. And so this is in great contrast, Paul says, to the power of God's Word. Which brings us to our third section, verses 24 and 25, the third section about the conversion of unbelievers. In contrast to the strange, unintelligible foreign languages, Paul considers how an unbeliever or an outsider, Paul uses both categories in verses 23 and in verse 24. He had talked about the outsiders in the last paragraph where uh, these are uh, Christians who are on the fringe, who may understand something of Christianity, uh, may even have some level of faith, but but haven't been instructed. Uh, They need to be built up by prophecy. And, And Paul is thinking about these unbelievers and these outsiders and how they might respond to prophecy given in a language that they can understand. And what Paul is saying here is that when the Word of God is read and proclaimed clearly, God's power works. So let's read what Paul says in verse 24. But if all prophesy, not speak in tongues, but if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Look what the Word does. The Word convicts unbelievers of their sin. The Word calls sinners to account before the throne of a holy, holy, holy God. And the Word of God discloses the secrets of the sinner's heart. I feel like you're talking right to me is how it feels sometime in worship when you hear the Word of the God, or the Word of God spoken. And how does the unbeliever respond in this moment? Well, Paul's saying, with prophecy, with the Word of God, the clear prophetic Word of God, the unbeliever will fall down on his face. He's going to bow down. He will worship God, and he will declare that God is really among you. Because prophecy is fitted to, it's fitting for, it's matched to belief. When the prophetic word of God goes out, unbelievers are converted into believers. And what's really interesting about the way Paul describes this is that last little phrase. They're going to declare that God is really among you. Now, Paul is referring back to other prophecies from the Old Testament. Not as clearly as he did in verse 21 where he gave an explicit citation and quotation from Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 and 12, but he says something that sounds like two different prophecies that appear in the Old Testament. One is in Isaiah 45, verse 14, and the other is in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. Now, what's so interesting about these texts that Paul is citing is that both of them essentially say the same thing, and both of them say the exact opposite of what happens is depicted in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 and 12, which Paul cited and quoted earlier. So what happened in Isaiah 28, Paul was saying, look, when you hear these strange tongues, these foreign languages, that is a sign, that is a signal that you are about to be carried away from your homeland, scattered into all kinds of foreign lands, where you will be surrounded all the time by exactly what you wanted unintelligible speech so that the word of the Lord cannot be a burden to you. But in these other two passages, what happens is when the prophetic word of the Lord goes out to all the nations of the earth in all of their various tongues, and they hear the word of the Lord, suddenly Gentiles are going to grab on to Israelites, to Jews, and say, take me with you because I have heard that God is truly among you. The Gentiles are coming to the promised land instead of the Israelites being taken by Gentiles out of the promised land. Let me read you these two verses, and you can hear how this is working. Isaiah 45, verse 14, Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabaeans, those are all different 
people groups, men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you saying, surely God is in you. And there was no other, no God besides him. Then in Zechariah chapter 8, I'll start in verse 22 and then go into 23. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from the nations of every tongue. It's the same word in the Greek translation of the Old Testament that Paul uses here. In those days, ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. When the word of God can be heard clearly, people will leave their countries and their languages behind to go where God is in their midst. Now remember, Paul is addressing this ancient church problem. The issues are always changing. There's always a new set of problems in the church. But these were specific and local that Corinth was facing. And all the problems and the issues have changed since then, and they will continue to change in the future until Jesus returns. But to argue against using these untranslated languages, Paul is appealing not just to a, a one-time idea, but to a timeless principle. He's saying, think about this. The issues always change. The principles will remain forever. So we need to ask then, how do the principles that we see in this passage apply to our worship? So, so in our application section, I'm going to give you three principles and three applications. I'll give you a principle, and then I'll apply that. Another principle, and then I'll apply that. And then a third principle, and then I'll apply that. So let me give you the first principle, and then we'll apply it. The first principle is this, that God is calling unbelievers to faith in Christ from every tribe, from every language, from every people, and from every nation. So again, when we step back from these immediate issues, the issues of, of Corinth and the untranslated foreign languages that they were using in their worship service, we see that Paul is reminding us of God's deep evangelistic concern for all the nations of the earth. Remember how the human race began. The human race began with one man, Adam. And in that one man, he became the father of the entire human race. But the problem was, because that one man rebelled against God, because he sinned, the entire human race fell in Adam. We became sinners in Adam because he is our first father in this world. Well, a little bit later, as the story of history goes on and reading the book of Genesis, you get to Genesis 11 where we find the Tower of Babel. We talked about the Tower of Babel a couple of weeks ago in the way that Paul refers to it um, in verses 11 and 12 of this chapter, or 10 through 12 of this chapter. And when we get to the Tower of Babel, the human race, who was all somewhat connected, they all spoke one language, they were one kind, well, God as a judgment against their skin be, or, or sin begins to uh, separate them off into different people groups speaking different languages. And these different people groups speaking different languages spread to all the various corners of the earth and to spread out throughout all of it. But out of God's deep love and mercy, God nevertheless made a plan to bless all the families of the earth in all the diversity of their languages. He didn't do this by sending out a broadcast to all the world at the same time. He did this rather by first revealing himself to one man, a man named Abraham, and then to save the world through that man's offspring. God promised, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed, Abraham. And God fulfilled that promise in one man raised up out of the family of Abraham, God's own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was died and buried, and he ascended, descended into hell, but rose again on the third day. This Jesus Christ is the one from whom salvation comes. Salvation is from the Jews. Through this one people group, God is blessing all the families of the earth through the one man, Jesus Christ. And now God is broadcasting the gospel. This message to, to every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation in their own languages, including to the people who live in Omaha, Nebraska, and speak English. On the other side of the world from Israel, on the other side of the world from Corinth, this gospel has come here. 
So the principle is that God is reaching every tribe, language, people, and nation. How do we apply that? Well, this morning, the first application is, is that as you have heard the prophetic word of God from the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, that bearing witness to God's only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in a language that you can understand, your first application point is to repent from your sins and to believe in Christ. Have you been convicted of your sins as you've listened to the Word of God this morning? Have you felt called to give an account for your sin and your uncleanness before a holy, holy, holy God? Have you had the sense that the secrets of your heart have been revealed and disclosed by God's Word? When Andrew talked this morning in the confession of sin about where is the center of your your consciousness uh, or where does your mind go when you're not thinking about other things, it's convicting for me. Maybe it's been convicting for you or maybe something else was convicting for you whether it's for the first time or the thousandth time, when the Word of God convicts you of sin, repent and turn to Christ in faith. That's the application, no matter who you are or where you have come from. Repent from your sins and believe the gospel. Here's the second principle. It was our big idea. The principle is that God converts unbelievers by His Word. Uh, Very often, we put far too much pressure on ourselves when we think about evangelism. I asked you that question earlier. What should we be doing as a church to pursue evangelism? And we get all worried. Am I going to say the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person? Am I going to drive someone away? Did I not say enough? And we spin around in circles because at the bottom, we have somehow come under the impression that the fruit of evangelism, success in evangelism, seeing people come to believe in Christ depends on me and my skill in talking to that person. And this passage teaches us the exact opposite. The power is not in how effective you may be. The power is in the Word of God to convert sinners. Now, some people certainly are gifted by God for evangelism, but even for them, it's not their skill. They would tell you, I have nothing. It is the Word of God that brings people to faith, and it's the same whether you have a lot of gifts or very few gifts in the area of evangelism. This passage tells us that our application is that we must let God's Word do the heavy lifting. Don't try to lift this with your own back. Let God's Word do the heavy lifting. Martin Luther has an incredible quotation about this. I know some of you were in a uh, a Reformation history class, studied Luther a little bit earlier. Let me read you something that Luther said at the end of his life when he was reflecting on the incredible changes that had spread through through the world because of preaching the gospel. He sort of sparked this movement, and and, and someone might have looked at uh, the effect and influence he was having and be tempted to pride, but not Luther. He writes, what is Luther? This teaching is not mine, nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I, poor stinking bag of maggots that I am, Luther always had a way with words, come to the point where people call the children of Christ by my evil name. I simply taught, preached, wrote God's Word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends Philip and Amsdorf, the Word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The Word did everything. When you think about evangelism, Is your confidence dependent upon your competence, on your skills? The application that we should draw from this is to let God's Word do the heavy lifting. Here's our third principle. That God's primary strategy for evangelism is our public worship. God's primary strategy for evangelism is our public worship. Now, sometimes when we think about evangelism, our minds go instantly to the evangelistic rallies, the the Billy Graham crusade, something along those lines, or or maybe with personal conversations with someone in a coffee shop, that kind of a thing. And we think exclusively about those, and I'm not criticizing those. I know many people have come to Christ through those methods, those means. But we should never lose sight of the fact that from beginning of the end of the Bible, We are told consistently that God's primary tool, God's primary strategy, what God has designed to reach the nations of the earth with the good news of Jesus Christ, is just what we're doing right now, public worship. 
You see this in the very beginning of the Bible. Uh, think about Abraham as he's moving in and like the first missionary into the land of Canaan. What does he do? He builds altars and he proclaims the name of the Lord to the surrounding Canaanites, preaching the gospel to draw people to faith in Christ. And we're told that people did come to believe in the true and living God through his preaching. Public worship, the public proclamation of God's word is what God wants to use. Now, this is so counterintuitive because our worship is so simple, it is so ordinary, it is so plain, there is nothing flashy about it. But remember what Paul said in verse 20, don't think like children about this. Don't evaluate this like you're six. Don't look for what's exciting and flashy. Ask yourself, where is the word of God? Because when the word of God is read and heard and sung and prayed and preached, And when it's portrayed for us in the sacraments, God's power is unleashed in its full force. We sang that from Psalm 29. The voice of the Lord shatters cedars. The voice of the Lord thunders. That's the power of God. Look for the Word. Because where the Word of God is there, God is really among you in all of His power by His Spirit. So I want to give you a very simple application for this principle. Invite an unbelieving friend to church. That's it. You don't have to worry about what you're going to say. You don't have to worry about trying to say the right thing at the right time or trying to figure out the magic silver bullet question that will open this person's life to you. Just invite them to the public worship of God. And you can even also do this, think about not only the unbeliever, but think about the outsider, the one who professes to be a believer in Christ, but does not regularly participate in the public worship of God. This is so important that we do. This is the reason why we are trying so hard, even in the midst of COVID, to get us all back together, because this is God's primary strategy, not only for building up His church, but for reaching the lost. And then after God's work has done its work, you still don't have to say anything. Just ask questions. Ask people what they heard. Ask them what questions they had. And then ask them to come again. It's as simple as that. It is in our regular, ordinary, simple, plain public worship that God converts unbelievers to faith. Not because of the skill of the musicians or the preacher or the fanciness of our building, but by God's prophetic word. When the word of God is preached and read and proclaimed, then God is really among us. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would deepen and strengthen our worship and not by bells and whistles that would appeal to children, but by mature thinking as we gravitate toward and grasp at and cling to the prophetic word of God given to us in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Thank you for speaking to us, Father. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand what you have spoken by the power of your Spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.